One of the most common things I hear from players is that short stack poker is just bingo. And that is absolutely not true. I actually made a class discussing this exact concept for my members of Poker Coaching Premium discussing this. So check it out. The question is, can we discuss stack size adjustments when we are late in a tournament and the average stack is 10 to 15 big blinds? Okay. Kind of a um, weird scenario, but it does come up. Since we are all dealing with small stacks, how do we further adjust for this without it being a shove fest? How would you recommend to play small top pairs? Well, we'll get there maybe. Again, if you all can hear me, please let me know. I need someone to type something in. And there it goes. Let's discuss the actual question because it's not actually very clearly defined. So are we in or out of position? What is the board? What are the ranges, right? You always wanna be asking yourself in these scenarios, what is the actual question? What are we trying to figure out? And this was like, th this question to me almost read of someone like complaining about the fact that many small and medium stakes tournaments do end up being 10 to 20 big blind poker, at least for some of the players at the table who are shallow stacked. And a lot of people want to cry. <laughs> Since we're dealing with small stacks, how do we further adjust without being a shove fest? Even when someone says something like shove fest or bingo poker or whatever, it makes me immediately think they are not very skilled at playing shallow stacks. So, so the next question made me kind of think the same thing. Well, how do we recommend playing small top pairs? That doesn't matter. How do we play our range? Our range is what matters. Um, this got me to thinking about, um, well, we'll get here in a second. Essentially, I don't think most people are aware of what Game Theory Optimal shallow stacked ranges look like. So I've been spending today making them for all of you. They're not available yet, but they will be available in the very near future. Um, they'll be included on poker coaching somewhere. So look for those. Um, so let's talk about the various scenarios. Out of position is the caller, in position is the caller, out of position is the razor, in position is the razor, right? Because there are many spots and all that really does define how you're going to be playing these scenarios. So in general, you should play as discussed in the poker coaching homework. You've done plenty of those. All of that logic still applies, except for you tend to want to have a little bit fewer draws when you are talking about putting your whole stack in and very often you will be putting your whole stack in post-flop. So from out of position as the pre-flop caller, when is that? That is when someone raises preflop, you call from one of the blinds. You should be checking almost every time, looking to check raise all in with most strong made hands and draws on coordinated boards and check call or check raise small with most strong made hands and draws on uncoordinated boards. So let's take a look at this very common scenario. Out of position with 15 big blinds, okay? Cut off men raises, we call from the big blind. So you see the hands here in white are not in our range. The obviously good ones, all these good ones, all these hands, all these pairs, we shoved preflop, okay? These hands in the bottom, we folded preflop. So that means we're flatting from the big blind versus a cutoff raise with all of this. Take a look. You see in this scenario, we're actually flatting a pretty good amount, right? We're flatting, um, well, really all these hands. I know I do make it clear. This is like a simplified GTO strategy. If you look at the actual GTO strategy, it's going to have you flatting with um, like king six suited sometimes, jamming it sometimes, flatting king five suited sometimes, jamming it sometimes. But these ratios of um, shove, call, fold still hold true. And th those are the charts I'm going to be making you all are simplified or I'm going to call them implementable game theory optimal strategies. Jim says, wait, we're defending 8-2 suited preflop? Yes. Every suited hand is a call preflop besides these few up here, which you're shoving. And that's because we're facing a min raise. Cut off min raises from 15 big blinds. We're in the big blind. This is the GTO strategy. Now, if you're on a bubble or something like that, maybe you need to play a little bit tighter. If you can make your opponent risk their whole stack on the bubble, maybe you need to play a little bit looser. Kind of hard to play a little bit looser. Maybe you need to be playing um, more aggressively post-flop. Anyway... You do need to be calling with every suited hand. Every suited hand is good enough facing a min raise because think about the odds, right? You're putting in one big blind to try to win your opponent's min raise, your call, plus the ante, plus the small blind. So 5.5 uh, big blinds is in the pot. You have to put in one. So you need to realize like 18% equity from out of position. And you're probably going to realize 23% equity on average with 8-2 with suited. Because, I mean, 8-2 suited is obviously behind your opponent, but it's probably going to have 35% equity. 
And you're gonna realize, I don't know, 60 something percent of it, 70% of it, something like that. Often more, because a lot of people aren't aggressive enough with their junky stuff. So yes, you're gonna underrealize your equity, but still you only need to realize 18%. You're gonna realize more than 18%. This is where a lot of the best players make their edge because they are willing to fight in the blinds and most people are not willing to fight in the blinds. All right, cutoff min raises. We call big blind flop comes jack, seven, five. We check everything. And if the opponent bets, we are going to use this strategy. So let's take a look. Um, we are check raising in this scenario with our strong made hands, which is gonna be basically our pairs. Pairs are good enough here. And we're also check raising with lots of draws, the draws being gut shots. Um, so that's typically what we're gonna be doing in this scenario. Our sizing depends a lot on what our opponent does. If our opponent bets like one big blind, we're gonna to want to have a smaller raise size than all in. If our opponent bets like four big blinds or three big blinds, then we're probably just going to want to be shoving because if we check raise versus a three big blind raise, we, we already have eight big blinds in the pot, right? So we are almost all in. But this is gonna be pretty decent. If you take a look at this, the only kind of junky draws we have are the gut shots, which is gonna be nine, six suited. Right, nine six suited is a junky gut shot, and then these gut shots are kind of junky. But even then, they still have plenty of equity because most of the time your opponent's not going to have top pair, and if your opponent does have top pair, well, that's a little bit unlucky. So you should have a lot of fold equity in the spot. Our calling range, take a look at that. Notice our calling range is all pretty good. We do have some slow plays, top pairs, aces, kings. It is worth mentioning we're flatting aces and kings pre-flop. We're not jamming them. And um, this, this looks pretty solid to me. We are check calling stuff like king high sometimes on the flop, which is a little bit dicey. You may want to just fold those. It is fine to under defend in these spots because of our excellent pre-flop pot odds. So if you tell me you want to fold out a little bit more of these hands on the flop, like king six, like king nine, stuff like queen 10, king nine, uh, it's probably okay to fold those. Obviously, even then, it's not like we're folding all of them because these, these have flush draws, right? So this is a spot where we can defend pretty much like this. There's not a whole lot the opponent can do about it. You may notice here we're also opting to call with some pairs, some of the fives. So we're, so we're calling with some fives and we're also calling with some jacks and some aces. And that's going to protect our range. And we're usually not looking to fold, well, top pair, clearly not. But like if we do have a five, often we're going to end up turning some draw. If our opponent puts us in, we just can't fold. That's really something you're going to find very often is that you're just not folding if you make anything when you have 15 big blinds. Sorry, you're going broke. And that's okay. So we're doing something like this, and I think this is pretty reasonable. Obviously, you could adjust a little bit, but I think it's fine. You may ask why we're like folding perhaps a six offsuit, but not king nine. It's because king nine has a little bit more equity. Mark says, so we're check calling queen nine of diamonds here. Again, depends on the opponent's size, right? Look at the hands that are on the cusp. Take a look at the cusp hands, right? Queen nine, clearly a cusp hand. King nine, clearly a cusp hand. King eight, clearly a cusp hand. So these hands, as your opponent bets bigger, you should start folding. As your opponent bets small, you should start calling. So if, if you check and your opponent bets one and a half big blinds into the 5.5 big blind pot, yeah, you should be calling with a lot of these hands. I mean, you don't love it, but you should. And it's nice because you're kind of protected because you have a decent amount of strong hands to check call with. You may want to strengthen your check calling range even more. Like I have no problem check calling 7-5 suited, jack 10, jack 9, if you think your opponent's going to continue barreling. But very often what people do is they raise preflop, they continuation bet one time, then they check down. And notice a lot of the hands that call once and then check down in this scenario do well enough. I mean, I'm not saying they're the best hands ever, but when you check call with like ace nine and it checks down, you, you often win. So that's what I would be doing in this scenario. All right, in position as the caller. This is when someone raises, you call on the button, let's say. So in this scenario, when facing a bet, which you often will, you should raise all in with strong made hands and draws on coordinated boards and call with strong made hands and draws on uncoordinated boards. If your range is especially strong, as it often will be in the spot, you should consider trapping with much or all of your range by calling. So what I mean by that is, um, well, cut off min raises, you call on the button. Take a look at this range. This is the button flatting range. Remember, put yourself in this scenario. How often... 
does the button raise and you flat. Button min raises, I'm sorry, cutoff min raises you flat on the button. I don't think many people are flatting like this with these hands, but you should be. Um, notice here, it's, it should be very clear, the hands that are not selected, like all these ace suited, king eight suited, nine eight suited, pocket sevens, small pairs, kings, ace king, all these hands are getting shoved pre-flop. Um, so obviously we have a very big shoving range here. But with 3.6% with, uh, of hands roughly, maybe a little bit more because of the board, but anyway, with some percentage of the hands, we should be flatting even with 15 big blinds. And, um, you know, if you wanted to try to play a really simplified strategy in this spot, you could just shove all in over a preflop raise with everything, but you're probably leaving a little bit of money on the table because you can't play some of these hands on the cusp as profitably. So anyway, say we do use this strategy, flop comes jack 7-5. If the opponent bets, we need to do this. Let's just break down the range by premium made hand draw, marginal made, and junk. You see premium made, top pairs are all great. Marginal made, pocket sixes. I mean, pocket sixes is pretty decent here. A7 is pretty good here. Don't know why only spades has selected. That's probably a mistake on my part. Um, marginal made are, well, A7 selected marginal made, but it should be all A7s are marginal made, clearly. Um, draws are these hands, and the junk are just the, um, I must have this selected right. I'm not sure why it's showing up like this. Anyway, the, the, the junk is ace high, king high, queen high, no flush draw. And even then, like with a club, it's not total junk, right? So we really don't have much junk at all on this exact board. Now this would change a little bit if the board was instead, let's say 10-7-5, because notice on 10-7-5, we have fewer 10s, right? Notice here we have king-jack, queen-jack, and jack-9, which line up just perfectly with a swap. Um, whereas if it's 10-something-something, 10-7-9, we have, now have king-jack and queen-jack that are junk as well, or kind of marginal hands. So it would change significantly. So it's important to understand what your range actually looks like. But in this scenario, our range is so strong that we should probably just call it everything. Because, like, think about the range, right? Whenever we, have, whenever we have king high, we don't really want to be raising or jamming it all in. Um, like, right? Again, it depends on your opponent's bet size, too. If your opponent bets one and a half big blinds, you probably should call with almost everything. Um, maybe actual everything. <laughs> Besides a6, I guess a6 you can fold. Um, but as you see, this board lines up pretty well with your range because we were playing a fundamentally sound preflop strategy. And again, you can go through and use these preflop ranges and figure out how your range interacts on various boards. And like I just said, 10-7-5 is going to be a decent amount different. Notice if it was queen-7-5, that's still pretty good, right? King-7-5, that's still pretty good. Really, you just want the presence of one big card because one big card is pretty nice. All right, in position as the preflop raisers. So this is where we raise preflop, the opponent calls. So in this scenario, we bet want to want to bet using a 50% pot bet size or so with most strong made hands and draws on coordinated boards and bet using a 30% pot size with almost your entire range on uncoordinated boards. If you all have had time to go through the cash game masterclass, the flop section, we discuss this thoroughly. Whenever the board is coordinated, you're usually not going to have such a range or nut advantage. So you want to be betting less frequently, but using a big size. When the board is uncoordinated, you usually have the range advantage, which allows you to bet everything kind of small. So let's see how it lines up here. Um, you min raise cut off. Weird double underline. I wonder what that's that there for. All right. You min raise cut off and big blind calls. What is your preflop raising range? Again, looks a little bit funny, right? That's because we are min raising all these hands and we're jamming the other stuff. King jack offsuit, ace jack offsuit, ace three offsuit, ace two suited, pairs, jack nine suited, king nine suited, right? We're jamming those hands preflop for 15 big blinds from the cutoff. And we're min raising these hands. So here's what we're doing. Take a look. Notice range is pretty good. In this scenario, since we are doing the continuation betting, it's not like we're check raising all in or anything like that. We can have more draws in our range. Um, but this this range actually works out just pretty nicely if you just break it down naturally because it's you know one to one ratio, which we could even have a few more draws if we wanted. And then this two to one checking range. You may opt to strengthen your checking range a little bit. Like I don't think it'd be insane to check aces. Um, and again, these post-flop solutions are not, they've not been run through a solver, but I can tell you it's going to be pretty close to this. And that's just because that's how these things normally get broken down. And you have to ask, so I want to try to memorize a chart or I want to know how to make the chart myself. And yes, we're going to be a tiny bit off game theory optimal doing it this way where we're just 
breaking our hand range down very obviously. Because I bet if you ran this to a solver, it'd probably tell you to check the aces some portion of the time and the king some portion of the time. And, you know, that's, that's slightly different than what we have here. But we are humans. We need to make our lives as easy as we possibly can. And this is, this is very nice. Um, given this range is so strong, because notice this one-to-one -one ratio makes our range pretty good. And notice all these hands in red are like really good. Like these are not, none of these are bad. <laughs> this even has this checking stuff like Jack eight every once in a while. So given all these hands are pretty good, we may want to just bet small with everything, even though this board is not incredibly uncoordinated or anything like that, but this is a pretty good spot. Um, so let's talk about out of position as the preflop raiser. This is when we raise and then um, late position calls. So here we want to bet using 50% pot size with most strong made hands and draws on coordinated boards, opting to check raise all in some portion of the time, usually when you don't mind protection. And you want to bet 30% pot with almost your entire range on the uncoordinated boards, opting to check raise all in some portion of the time, which is kind of difficult to show on our range analyzer chart, but like right here, Notice the range breaks down exactly the same because we have our same range. Um, it is a little bit different here though. I do want to make it clear. Um, you want to check here more often now due to being out of position against a stronger range, right? So say we raise and the big blind calls. Big blind's range is a bunch of garbage to some extent. It's not all garbage, but some garbage. Whereas, well, here, I'll show it to you. <laughs> Here's the big blind range, right? Clearly a lot of garbage. Whereas the buttons range is this range, which is much, much stronger, right? So in this scenario, we need to be doing more checking because if we bet everything, your opponent can your opponent's range is pretty strong. So we probably want to start by a check, uh, strengthening our checking range even more in this scenario because we are out of position against a stronger range. So that's almost certainly going to mean checking aces, kings, queens, sometimes jacks, sevens, uh, stuff like that. And you know, you could actually probably develop a check raising all in range. In this scenario, if you feel like it, I don't think that would be absurd, especially if you think your opponent's going to be betting the flop very frequently when check two. Um, so I think that's probably reasonable. Jim says, so there's a relationship here between range advantage, nut advantage, coordination, and uncoordination. You watch the flop and the next video in the Cash Game Masterclass, but how to consider all four of these hasn't quite sunk in. Can we comment on this? Yeah, I mean, pretty much, first things first, do we have a big range advantage? If you do, just bet everything. Um, next, if we don't have the range advantage, does our opponent have a big nut advantage? If your opponent has a big nut advantage, you want to be doing a lot of checking. If you don't have the range advantage, you want to be doing a lot of checking. If you, if you have a lot of nuts in your hands, but your range is generally weak, you want to be doing a lot of check raising, which is going to happen a lot when someone raises, you call big blind and it comes like seven, six, six. You have a lot of sevens and, or sixes, whereas your opponent has almost none. Um... So that's the spot where you want to be doing a lot of checking because you don't have the range advantage, but you have the nut advantage, so you want to be check raising. Um, the reason, by the way, the big blind doesn't do lead, doesn't lead essentially ever from a game theory optimal point of view, or very rarely from uh, on the flop, is because you almost never have the range advantage. Well, you just don't, right? Because you're defending all sorts of garbage. The only time sometimes it lines up decently well is when um, like button will raise and big blind calls. Then maybe sometimes it just lines up perfectly usually when it's the middle cards, but even then it's still not great. So you want to be doing a lot of checking in the check raising. So anyway, um, coordination, coordination slash uncoordination of the board will impact a few things. Um, as the board is more coordinated, usually the ranges start to line up a little bit more depending on, on how it's coordinated, right? If like if it's middle cards, now range advantage, no one really has a range advantage most of the time in that spot. If it's all big cards, then the preflop raiser has a huge range advantage and a huge nut advantage. As the board is more uncoordinated, you're very often going to want to use a small bet size because your opponent's unlikely to have anything. And as the board is more coordinated, you're often going to want to use a bigger bet size. Um, so say you raise under the gun and then like low jack seat calls and it comes king, queen, jack. Like right there, but that flop lines up really well with both players' range ranges, but... Under the gun just has way more nut hands. They have all the super nut hands, whereas low jack or high jack, whichever one I said, does not. So that's a spot where under the gun can just be betting big with everything. Even though the board's um, coordinated, they should still be betting very frequently because it connects with them. So there's, there's a lot of little pieces at work. And Jim, I'll tell you, just practice it over and over and over again, and it will become second nature eventually. And look, you're still not going to get it right all the time. But... 
as you practice more and more, it will start to make sense. Bill says the top players who study and play GTO learn the actual percentage to the point that they are really, for example, checking X percent of the time, aces X percent of the time. Um, some, I mean, listen, no one's doing it. Look, I'm going to check this 28% of the time. It's more like I'm going to check this 75%, 50%, 25%, or 0%. And again, I don't think it's that big of a deal unless you're playing against like the absolute best players in the world and, and you're like really striving to be balanced. But, um, it's certainly not relevant for 99.9999% of poker players to worry about that kind of thing. First things first, just figure out how to play something like this and you're going to be miles ahead of everybody you're playing against because they're just going to be like betting everything, right? And like we see right here, very clearly we need to be checking at least 45% of the time and actually the number's probably higher. So, which, which is why I said we need to be slow playing sometimes because we're out of position in this spot. So, that is very relevant. Let's see. You'll take notes on this once the recording's ready. It's not second nature to you, but can, you can see it becoming that way. So Jim, I know there is in the Cash Game Masterclass, there's a flop summary. Go watch the flop summary. That's that's your notes on it. Uh, let's see. You also have to consider blockers, size of the pot, bet sizing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Poker is hard. Yes, poker is hard. And that's good. We want poker to be hard. If poker was easy, then, well, we wouldn't be playing it, most likely. We'd be playing a more difficult game. But anyway, as you see, I want to go over here go and go back and comment on the question. The initial question, can we discuss stack size adjustments? The adjustment is to play well. It's not an adjustment. The adjustment is to play good, fundamentally sound poker. Since we are dealing with small stacks, how can we further adjust for this without the fear of being a shove fest? And you have to realize, whenever you open, well, let, let me just show you. Whenever you open this from the cutoff, right, it's pretty obvious which hands you're calling a shove with. Life's easy. We open this, this range. We're going to call with sevens and better. We're going to call with king jack suited and better. We're going to call probably about ace nine suited and better. Then we're going to fold everything else. And that's it. Easy, right? Um, so that, that's pretty much how you want to go about this. Notice that whenever you flat, say um, cut off raises, you flat button. If small blind shoves or big blind shoves, yeah, you're folding a lot. You're probably actually supposed to call with sixes and fives and aces, if I had to guess. But... Obviously, you're protected because you have aces sometimes, which is very important. Notice if you just didn't have aces here, now you'd be very susceptible to getting jammed on. But by playing the fundamentally sound strategy, it becomes a little bit easier. I'm actually kind of surprised kings or maybe ace-king suited is not a flat here. But, yeah, whatever. <laughs> still still a very, very strong range, right? But anyway, you always want to be asking how ranges interact on various boards, and that will often determine your bet size. But anyway, I want to make it clear. It's not just a shove-fest preflop. I mean, clearly here... I don't know what percentage of hands we're playing. It's probably a lot. But some portion of the time, we should still be flatting. And if you're not doing that, you're, you're leaving money on the table. And you have to get better at playing post-flop. I think that's something else people are deathly afraid of. They're like, flat with sixes. What about when it comes jack seven, five? Yeah, well, sometimes it gets dicey. And you have to become comfortable with realizing, you know, when you're playing with 60% of the field left in a tournament with 15 big blind stacks, like often will be the case in small stakes live tournaments, or... Whenever you're playing online and you're like in the money, but there are no payout jumps for forever because there's a thousand people in the money, well, <laughs> it's, you're basically playing a cash game. And that is, that is what these charts are excellent for. Obviously, it changes as stacks start to vary or um, as the payout jumps are looming, but this is a good starting point. I mean, you have to be very careful blindly following charts because they don't apply in many scenarios, but... A lot of people just try to go all in or fold with 15 big blinds. And if you do that, you are lighting your money on fire. I hope you enjoyed this class on shallow stacks play. I hope you learned something. If you did, let people know in the comments section below so that they know the things to be looking for. Also, if you like this video, click like, click subscribe. And if you want more in-depth training content like this on literally every subject pertaining to no limit hold'em that you can think of, check out Poker Coaching Premium at pokercoaching.com slash premium. I made it just for you so that you could be the best poker player you can possibly be. Hope you enjoy it. Good luck in your games. Have fun. And I'll talk to you next time.